Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. Now back in December I posted part 3 of the 124th Airfix Spitfire build, covering the Merlin engine, but on starting this video to finish the build I discovered that I was missing Sprue M, which holds just one part, the upper nose cowling, without which I couldn't finish up. I sent an email to Airfix customer support, but as it was Christmas it wasn't until well into the new year that it arrived, so I've posted a number of other videos in the interim whilst I completed what I needed for this video, hence the delay. In the interim, the channel has grown to over 7,500 subscribers, so thank you all for that, it's absolutely tremendous. Now to begin with, I needed to address probably the most visible join on the kit thus far, which is on the underside of the fuselage to the wing join section. I used thin sprue goo to address this, followed by sanding, taking care to protect the kit's engraved detail. Next up were the browning machine guns and Hispano cannons, which I had previously sprayed black. I used graphite powder applied to these painted surfaces and gave them a light polish with a brush to create a very realistic gunmetal effect. I cemented the Hispano cannon in place, but left off the clockwork belt feeds. These done, I painted the shells for the brownings, followed by a wash and other detail pieces that needed it. The brownings were then put into positions as indicated in steps 88 and 94. Following that, I decided I would fix the lower wing gun access panels after all, so attach these as shown in step 96. One thing I should say here is that I made a mistake in the wings, in that there are ejector pin marks on the inside that I failed to fill, thinking these wouldn't be visible. It turns out that they are, so be warned if you're looking to display these panels open and really want to make your kit look the best it can. They're shallow and not easy to spot, but I know they're there. With these in position, it was time for some weathering in the gun bays. Although there were extraction systems for the gun smoke, these were far from perfect and these areas would have gotten dirty and I wanted to weather them in situ to tie all the components together. I used my homemade dark brown weathering powders to create these effects. Skipping ahead to step 203, I attached the flaps in their raised position, since Spitfires didn't generally have lowered flaps on the ground, except for takeoff and landing. This was straightforward, since the sections near the fuselage are separate from those on the inner wings, and they went on without any issues. With that done, it was back to the attachment of the upper wings. I used contactor cement here on all the spars, cross supports, edges and other bay walls to ensure that this was very secure. Despite the engineering of the kit and the lack of what I'd normally call wiggle room here, I did find the fit of the wings a little problematic where they joined the fuselage. I found I needed a lot of pushing on one side to get even close to a flush join and there is a small gap on the rear of where the wing meets the port fuselage trailing edge, so be warned. I decided not to attach the wing radiators until after painting, so I masked the radiators therein and just placed the doors in the open position. These are a perfect fit, so actually don't need cementing at all should you wish to have the flexibility in posing them. Steps 113 and 114 bring us to the wingtips, a part that I usually dread because of the possibility of misalignment, but I was pleasantly surprised by how well these seated and they were secured with Tamiya Extra Thin with no issues. One hundred and ninety and one hundred and ninety one attached the wing root panels, which seated well on the wings, but needed a bit of coaxing to achieve a suitable fit elsewhere. Part of the problem here is that they form a union between three separate surfaces that are all constructed at separate times, which isn't ideal. Personally, I'd have preferred these to have been incorporated with the rest of the upper wing. 
193 sees us bring the carburetor intake scoop onto the engine assembly, which is a very positive fit. Step 194 is the chin cowling, which I'd glued previously but does feature a prominent seam along its length. Masking off the inscribed detail, I set about removing this by sanding. On the inside of the piece there are location lugs for joining the two halves, which I carved off with my scalpel. I then filled the ejector pin marks and any rough areas from this carving with thin sprue goo applied with a flexible sculptor's tool. Once dried, I ground this down using extension attachment on my Dremel, which helps in accessing these sorts of areas without having to support the weight of the tool at the same time. I then gave this surface a sanding with a couple of grades of sanding pad. I used a small ball grinding bit on my extension tool to smooth out the interior of the carburetta scoop. I then went over the entire inside with Mr. Surfacer 500. Step 196 deals with the port engine cover, and as I wanted to be able to display this open, I needed to remove the ejector pin marks which I'd already filled with sprue goo. I did this with the trusty sanding pads. I then again painted with Mr. Surfacer 500. And then wet sanded this. and finally cleaned it up with tissue. One ninety seven has us attaching the bulged cover to the starboard cowling, and I did the same cleanup on the inside of this part too. One ninety eight deals with the previously missing nose, which also needs the ejector pin sorting in the same manner as for the chin cowling. Last for this piece is the intake on the rear starboard of the cover, which goes on without any issues. Steps 199 and 200 cover the making of the exhausts. These are two part assemblies which are fiddly due to their size, but aren't too bad. They do need a little filling to hide the seams when finished, which I achieved with thin sprue goo. After cleaning this up, I then painted them with Vallejo matte black acrylic. And when those were dry, they went through the same graphite metalling process as the armament. Now I apologise for the focus here, but it was difficult to show putting the exhaust into the engine block with the aircraft almost fully assembled, but fortunately this is a relatively simple step provided you work from back to front and ensure they're well seated. Back to the outer panels now, because I wanted the flexibility to show these open or closed, I decided to magnetise them. That started with me using a 1mm bit to drill through the large retaining bolt locations in the panel, 
Then holding the panel in place, I drilled through this into the support structure on the interior. Now I'm using these tiny 1mm diameter neodymium magnets, which I can push fit into the hole as a stack to leave just one in there. Here I'm pushing another into the hole in the support. Here you can see the magnet in the frame there. Now these are tiny but pretty powerful, just one can hold a panel in place, though I'm adding more of course. Moving on, we cover the construction of the port earlier on in step 204, which is a pretty simple affair. Note that the inner piece is what attaches to the wing, so it's only necessary not to cement it until you know what position you want your ailerons, at which point you can fix them. Step 205 is exactly the same for the starboard side, and I'm only really showing it here because mine had a substantial piece of flash here that needed carving off before I could do anything else with it, as you can see. I also managed to put a nice fingerprint in the silver spray, so I needed to deal with that here as well before I set it aside. We can then attach the ailerons onto the wing in step 206, the two segments in the subassembly sliding very positively into their locating positions. Just make sure they're pushed forward sufficiently before you cement them. Two hundred seven has us construct the two pieces Sparno cannon covers. These go together nicely, but the seams are not invisible. That means we need a little sprue goo and sanding to complete them. Once complete and dry, they fit into the wings perfectly, having a small slot to ensure they install in the correct orientation and sit correctly. Two one seven and two twenty create the inner parts of the wheels, depending on which version you are building. We have four spoke wheels on this aircraft, and they offer no difficulties providing you get them aligned correctly. Two eighteen and two twenty one have us bring the scissor assembly onto the main landing gear strut. These are easy to put on, but because they're molded in one piece, the holes in them are a little odd, so I did drill these out. Once dry, I sprayed these aluminium and then masked off the oleos with artist masking fluid. 219 and 222 create the wheels from two-piece tyres and the prior hub assemblies. The tyres are slightly flattened and go together perfectly. The hubs slide into the tyres snugly and have a small lug to ensure they maintain the correct angle. I sprayed these aluminium and then sanded the tyres to remove any trace of their seams, which didn't take long. Before doing anything with the wheel bay covers, they have three prominent ejector pin marks which are not wholly covered by the landing gear struts. I filled mine with sprue goo, and when dry I sanded these down. It should be noted at this point that there are visible brake lines on the Spitfire, which I didn't add here as this is an out of the box build, but in this scale I think it's an odd omission by Airfix, and definitely one you may want to add yourself. Step 231 covers the building of the four piece tailwheel assembly. This presents no particular problems, but does need some seam filling at the bottom of the strut.
going to step 234, we make the deflection gun sight for the cockpit. Again, this has some fiddly pieces, but nothing terrible. I left off the transparency until after painting. Step 239 brings us back to the two-piece props that I built and sprue gooed in part 3, so now it was a matter of sanding this all down to get a nice finish again, which I did over the span of 240 to 800 grit sanding pads. Once finished, I sprayed these aluminium and set them aside. Now I was getting close to painting, I went back to step 98 and tacked the wing gun covers in place with PVA glue so I could remove them afterwards. I did find the outer browning panels needed a slot cutting from them for the panels to sit flush, as you can see here. Back to the main sequence, and step 236 has the main aerial mast attached, though I left the upper identification light off for now. In hindsight, I'd have waited until after putting the undercarriage on as you're supposed to, because this did make things more awkward. One thing to be careful of here is how the aerial sits. Mine wasn't vertical despite no visible problems in either the part or the fuselage seating, so just watch that when you attach yours. It'll look instantly wrong if it's at an angle of a few degrees. Steps 225 and 226 deal with attaching the main undercarriage struts. These are a very tight fit, and it's worth making sure that there's no burrs or paint on them before you try putting them in. There's also definitely a knack to getting them into the bay to be able to locate them. I also found that it's worth partly pushing the main struts in before trying to place the mechanisms in 223 and 224. These locate on the front wall of the main spar and have a small tab that locates in the main strut. Once glued, you can then push the main strut in fully to catch the tab and secure everything without worry. As you can see though, this requires some force. I use some bent nose pliers here to apply this appropriately to avoid breaking anything. Steps 227 and 228 attach the panels that cover this part of the gear bay. And if your struts aren't in fully, these won't seat. Even if you do, I found my port panel wouldn't seat and had to trim it down to avoid hitting the back of the strut. Even then, I still needed to shave a little off the top of the strut for it to sit properly. I had no such issue with a starboard panel. A quick test fit of the cover showed all was well with the nug fits, so I removed it until after painting. The gap between the port wing and fuselage was masked to protect the detail, and then filled with sprue goo, applied with a micro applicator and smoothed with a silicone sculpting tool. I masked off all the areas I didn't want aluminium or had already been treated and then gave the entire aircraft an overall coat of rattle can aluminium spray. Apart from acting as a primer and base for future chipping, this is also really good at highlighting imperfections, joins etc that need addressing. I'll spare you more sanding, but the main areas that needed attention were the front wing joins, which were masked, sand, and resprayed. When happy with these, I sprayed the entire aircraft with army paint and matte coat, and when that was dry, Vallejo chipping fluid. What was missing from the aircraft now were its rear control surfaces and transparencies. The former had an unsightly seam at the trailing edge, so I used a little Tipex correction fluid to fill this. This has the advantage of fluidity, quick drying, and being easy to sand, so it doesn't take long until these were done. Unlike the rest of the aircraft, the rear control surfaces were red doped fabric over a metal skeleton, so I used a mix of Chimera colours Toluidine Red and Orange through the airbrush to prime them. I also gave the rear control surfaces a coat of pledge to seal them when they were dry. For the transparencies, I masked them inside and out with Tamiya tape. Once complete, I covered this with artist masking fluid to fill any gaps or cracks between tape pieces before spraying them aluminium, followed by army painter matte varnish. I then gave them a coat of Vallejo chipping fluid, 
after which I sprayed the interiors with Hitaka Hobbies RAF Interior Grey Green. When that was dry, I unmasked the interior sections. The last steps were attached the rear horizontal stabilizer control surfaces, which went on at a pronounced angle as seen in wartime photographs. The rudder then followed suit. I then glued the front and rear transparencies in place with PVA glue. So, resplendent in her bare metal, our Spitfire is ready to go onto the final chapter, which I'll cover in the next video, painting and weathering. I hope I've earned your subscription and that you'll click the notification bell so that you'll see that video when it comes out. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you're feeling generous, then I also have a Patreon, which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modeling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.